Hello, everyone. This is Dory Clark, and we're here with our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. Our guest this week is Marcus Collins. He's the author of the new book, For the Culture. The subtitle is The Power Behind What We Buy, What We Do, and Who We Want to Be. Marcus, welcome. Great to have you. Thanks for having me, Dory. I'm so excited to be here. Excellent. So, Marcus, let's let's start. You know, let's let's go let's go deep uh, with this subtitle. You're so I was struck, and I, I think you know most people can probably agree. If you dive into it, culture really is in a lot of ways about who we want to be. Mm-hmm. And you have worked for a lot of what I would call aspirational companies. Um, you did a stint at Apple. You ran digital strategy for Beyonce. Uh, now you are the chief strategy officer at Wyden and Kennedy, the well-known uh, the well-known uh, advertising agency uh, in their New York office. So you, you've done a lot of really cool things. Talk to us a little bit more about how culture and identity factor in. What What's happening there and how, how, do, how do advertisers and, and companies who want to reach people actually leverage identity in this way? Sure thing. You know, uh, the way the early scholars talk about culture, it's a system of conventions and expectations that demarcate who we are and what people like us do. And that idea of demarcating who we are, to your point, goes right at identity. Who are we? How do we subscribe our identity to different communities, organizations, cohorts and collectives. And it's because of our identity, who we are, we adopt a certain way of seeing the world, a set of beliefs and ideologies that frame the world for us. And because we see the world a certain way, we therefore show up in the world a certain way. We adopt a shared way of life, how we dress, how we talk, what we do. And then we express it through certain cultural production, music, film, television, the like. And it's the alchemy of those systems, kind of a system of systems that represent our culture, but it's anchored in our identity. Because of who we are, we feel a sense of of obligation to show up in the world a certain way. And I love the way um, Emil Durkheim, one of the founding fathers of sociology, he refers to it as collective effervescence, which is just a beautiful phrase. You know, it's the social pressures that's pushed on us that because of our membership in a community, we therefore act in concert to promote social solidarity among ourselves. Right. So it's because of who we are that we wear what we wear, drive what we drive, go to school where we go to school, if you go to school, marry who you marry, if you marry, where you bury the dead, if you bury the dead. All these things are byproducts of who we are. And our culture, that is the system for everyday living, is a byproduct of that very thing. And for marketers, that's super powerful because our job is to get people to to move to adopt behavior. And if we can find co- uh, some alignment or, uh, uh, or some type of connection between the culture to which people subscribe and the brands that are reflections, that are, co- that are connected to those cultures, then people are more inclined to consume from those brands versus another. That's a really interesting point, Marcus. That's great. So as one example, you know, that I was enjoying when when I was reading your book, you were talking about something that you learned during your time working for Beyonce, that there was originally, I, su- I suppose, a, uh, a concept about uh, creating the Beyonce-rage. <laughs> and quickly, the folks who were in charge realized that that wasn't quite the right framing, that Beyonce's community had kind of created its own thing and that they were the beehive. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the distinction and what what you discovered along the way about how people were choosing to self-identify? Absolutely. You know, we as marketers, as leaders, as managers, as entrepreneurs, as politicians, we go into the world thinking about building community. We're going to create a community. And that's what we thought when we were trying to move Beyonce's offline fan club online. Let's build an online community of fans. And when we launched that online community of fans, it was nowhere in comparison to her celebrity. Right. And we said, something's not working here. What's what's going on? Why isn't this thing working beyond the name? the entourage being terrible, something was not, not working in our favor. And as the team looked across the social web, they realized there were a group of people who were already connected because of their, not only their shared fandom, that was the small part, but it was really about uh, their shared belief, their shared ideology about women's empowerment. And Beyonce was sort of a totem to express 
that shared ideology. And they had their own set of behaviors, their own set of artifacts, their own set of language. They were, as a collective, operating inside of a culture. So the team said to ourselves that maybe we should just cut bait on this Beyontourage thing and actually just work with them. And that became the official fan club for Beyonce, activating, facilitating this collective of people, this community of people who call themselves the Beehive. And now that's the official fan club. And I think the most powerful thing about that for me is that you don't go to build community. You facilitate community. You find people who see the world the way you do. And then you use your resources to help facilitate their connections by removing points of friction that keep them from realizing their ambitions or use your resources to help them feel seen, to be seen, to feel heard and to be heard. I think that small, what may seem like a trivial uh, nuance, that, 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 that shift in perspective, I think it has a massive impact on how you show up in the market, i.e. how you show up within uh, the, the, the collective of people. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. This is Dory Clark. This is our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. And our guest this week is Marcus Collins. His new book is For the Culture. Now, Marcus, in addition to your work at Wyden and Kennedy, you also uh, have a foot in academia. You teach at uh, the University of Michigan Ross School of Business. I'm curious, can you talk a little bit about what you feel like academia gets wrong about business and also, you know, maybe what business is missing about academia? Um, you know, what what is the, the disconnect uh, here or or is that overblown? Is there not really a disconnect? Well, there certainly is a gap for sure. I think academia as an institution, we are committed to the acquisition and dissemination of knowledge. And that acquisition and dissemination of knowledge requires great, great rigor. And that rigor takes time. However, in practice, there is a, uh, an emphasis on application execution. And those things are of a, a much shorter time horizon. And because of those differences, we tend to be out of sync. The things that academia studies, sometimes it's not contemporary enough to capture what's happening in, in today's world. And sometimes, oftentimes, what's happening in the application of today is missing the rigor of academia. So what I've done, and people like me who have a foot in two different worlds, academia and practice, our goal, our job is to bridge the academic, the academic practitioner gap, taking these things that we rigorously interrogate as academics and apply them to the things that happen today. And having a foot in both worlds helps us reduce the time horizon that separates the two, but also keep in mind the... The, the needs and wants of each one of these entities. We want rigor over here, we want application over here. And those things don't have to be binary. They don't have to be, uh, you know, this, uh, this bifurcation between the two. I think the more that we understand what the problems that we're trying to solve are actually benefit both worlds, then they'll come much closer together as opposed to being two different worlds that, are, that happen to be uh, operating at the same time. Yeah, that's a great point. We're here with Marcus Collins. His book is For the Culture. If you want to learn more about Marcus and his work, the website is marktothesea.com. So Marcus, one of the things that I think anybody who's a contemporary observer of culture, you know, notices is that a lot of the organic culture that that becomes you know broadly disseminated actually originates in in the African American community. And when it comes to diversity issues, you know, which we focus on in the, the show better, the question that I have is how, if you're a corporation, how do you sort of balance that? How do you balance the idea of like kind of cool hunting and identifying like, oh, you know, this has traction. There's something awesome here without being sort of weird and exploitive and tokenistic yeah. where it's like, oh, here, you know, here's, here's a, a, a minority community doing something interesting. Let's grab it. Uh, so, <laughs> so how do you, how do you straddle that line? That seems possibly complicated. Well, it is complicated. It's complex, but it's not impossible. I mean, the point you make, I think is, has been supported in the literature is that typically most innovation comes from marginalized communities because they have less. Right. As, as by the sheer nature of being marginalized, you therefore you're making lemonade out of lemons. Right. Which happens to be good, by the way, lemonade. Um, so you've got marginalized communities that are creating the things that seem to be on the, the bleeding edge of contemporary culture. So, of course, brands, companies, organizations, institutions, politicians, activists and the like are often trying to find the rocket that they can attach themselves to and take advantage, benefit from said cultural wake. And the difference between being exploitive 
and being appreciative requires understanding meaning, right? We know this when we talk about uh, a, a cultural appropriation. This is where we take the meaning markers from one group of people, the cultural markers from one group of people, and then we assign new meaning to them as if you, Christopher Columbus, this thing, right? As if it didn't exist, you took it and gave it new meaning. Look what I discovered. Um, that is at its core, the, 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 the driving uh, argument for cultural appropriation. There are multiple ways of appropriating, but that appropriation is exploitive in nature. It's cultural explore, um, exploitation. But if we understood the core meaning behind these markers and said, oh, I understand what it means to these people. And what we're going to do is celebrate it as opposed to conquest it. You change the dynamic in which you interact or engage with these markers. And it goes from being an exploitive uh, gesture on behalf of the brand to help people feel seen, to help people be heard. Like we talked about with the beehive, how you help facilitate communities, help them be seen and be heard. And you use their markers as a way to wink and nod saying, I get it. I, I understand you. And when an organization, institution, brand, or entity are able to understand the nuances of a given group of people, those people go, oh, you see us. And perhaps you're one of us. Come on in. And they actually welcome you into uh, into the fold and you, your brand, your organization become a way by which that community expresses themselves to the world. I mean, there's been a long line of brands who've done this very well from the 90s. Think of Subaru all the way to something a bit more a more present, uh, 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 more, more near term like Beats by Dre, for instance. Right. These brands have not conquested. Uh, the cultural markers of groups of people. Instead, they have contributed to them. They celebrate them. They put it on a pedestal so those people feel heard and feel seen. And therefore, the brand becomes an extension of their identity. Yeah, that's a, a great distinction. Thank you. We're here with Marcus Collins. The book is For the Culture. Now, Marcus, I <laughs> something we, we have in common, although I think uh, you took it a little further than I did, uh, is that when I was in college, I was, uh, I too was, uh, I was an intern uh, in strategic planning at an advertising agency. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. So I, I dipped my toes in the water uh, at TBWA Shyot Day. Uh, so I, I always loved, uh, you know, the idea of being able to be sort of, um, you know, the, the kind of cult, cultural researcher, translator, et cetera. Because, you know, for um, for people, I'll just mansplain for a minute here. For people <laughs> who don't know about advertising, uh, typically, you know, there's the creatives who make the ads. There's the account people who sell the ads. But like, where do you get the data and the inspiration? Well, that's the strategy people. And so this is kind of a new thing in the in the 90s. Anyway. Apparently you've taken it and run with it, but I would be very curious. Can you talk a little bit more about what your role entails these days? And also what, you know, if, if your mandate is to kind of look at strategy, look at the culture writ large, what are the things that you're reading? What are the things that you're looking at? What is your diet to mm -hmm. figure out what is going on, Marcus? Well, I think my job by and large is get to the truth. What is the truth about these people? And how is it congruent with the brand and its branded products? Now, the thing to understand about the truth is that the truth is not objective. It's subjective, right? Uh, for some, a cow is leather. For others, it's a deity. And for some, it's dinner. But which one is it? It's all of those things. And therefore, we have to look at the truth through the cultural lenses of the people that we're targeting, that we're going after, that we're trying to engage. Not the demographic box that we put them in, but the groups of people that subscribe their identity to a certain community that have cultural uh, facts or cultural uh, characteristics that govern who they are. So once I look at the truth through those cultural lenses, those meaning making lenses that people use to in, to translate and interpret the world, I go, okay, so where is there opportunity for this brand to find congruence with these people? Where is there an, an overlap? And you know, while I spend a lot of my times reading a lot of literature, like particularly sociological literature, anthropology, some some social psychology, behavioral economics, I usually spend my my media diet just consuming the cultural production of those groups of people. Like listen to what they listen to, watch what they watch, listen to their podcasts, spend tons of too much time uh, in subreddits, like trying to become a part of them, trying to go native as, as, as it were, 
Um, so who are you tracking? Who are, who are the groups that you're trying to understand? So most recently, I'd say uh, doing a lot of work with McDonald's fans. <laughs> like, who are these people that not only eat at McDonald's, but people who subscribe their identity to being a fan of McDonald's? What do they talk about? Where do they go? What do they do? What do these, th these, these artifacts of the brand mean to them? Because they're not just a burger. They're not just a box that has, you know, kid, kid food inside of it. It means more to them. And trying to understand how they make meaning in the world, how they translate the world, so that when the brand talks to them, they sound like they're one of them, like a fan talking to a fan. So that's one example of a community of people that I'm trying to understand how they make meaning of the world. Um, another one, you know, a few years ago, I spent a lot of time digging into the world of Stranger Things. Like, who are these people who call themselves Stranger Things fans? Not people who just listen to Stranger Things or watch Stranger Things, people who are fans, right? It's like, it's finding the beehive among people who listen to Beyonce, finding the Trekkies among people who watch Star Trek. My, finding the liberals among people who vote democratic, right? It's finding the believers, the people who subscribe to the identity of the ideologies of these groups of people, and then finding out what are the things that they use to express who they are, but also reflect what people like them ought to do. And the better we understand those things, the better we understand the nuances that make them tick, the more likely we are to find congruence, if there is congruence between the brand and the people. And that's fascinating. We're here with Marcus Collins, the author of the new book, For the Culture. Now, Marcus, one thing that we do every week on Better is we have our guests nominate someone to be the Better Leader of the Week. And this is your choice of someone that you know or have worked with who you believe is making a positive difference in, in, in whatever capacity this looks like, advancing diversity issues in a positive way. You selected Aiden Million as the Better Leader of the Week, and we would love to hear why. Aiden, I uh, had the fortunate pleasure of meeting by happenstance, call it serendipity, call it divine, call it the universe. Um, we met and immediately I knew there was something special about her and I hired her right away, just right away. You got to come work with me. Um, and what I found about Aiden is that she has this very unique background. She is Ethiopian. Um, she grew up in Switzerland. Um, she's not American, but she lives here in, in the States now and she works in strategy as an advertiser. And to your point, we talked about earlier that she has to see the world through different lenses. And because she's not American and she didn't grow up here, she looks at what may seem familiar to us through strange lenses. She goes, that's really strange that you do that. And I go, wow, I didn't even see that. It, it, it's, it's, it's almost, it's like nose blindness. You don't know what your, your house smells like until someone else comes in and go, what is that smell? Like she's so good at doing that very thing. And to be as young as she is, but to be so empathetic, it's, I'm just fascinated by it. Um, she's a really critical thinker and she's always thinking about the people who don't have a voice. And when, I think when people are able to view the world through the lens of marginalized communities, you find much more humanity at the center of what they do. And considering the field in which I work in, at least one half of me works in, in advertising, we need more humanity as we think about bringing products to market and how we communicate to groups of people. How do we tap into what is culturally relevant, but do so in a way that's responsible and respectful? And I look at Aiden, she is the, the personification of what this industry can be and arguably should be. And I tell her all this all the time, we'll all be working for her in this industry in, in you know, 15, 20 years, because she's just that great. I love it. Thank you very much. And congratulations, Aiden, on being the better leader of the week. So Marcus, one of the things that you talk about in your book, I know this is something that you have studied extensively, and it's, you know, sort of the, uh, in many ways, the core of your PhD research is around concepts of cultural contagion. Now, this is something that I think probably many companies, uh, many advertisers, many influencers are striving for that they would love to, uh, to hit virality, that they would love to uh, become culturally contagious. What are the key principles that you've internalized about what makes something more likely to go viral? And, and how do you think about that or reference that in your own work? So I, there, there, are a few, there are a few conditions need to be met. I mean, the idea of going viral it is random. It's more randomness than anything else. So if anyone says, I can make you go viral, they're lying to you. Um, they can increase the likelihood for sure, 
but to promise that it's just it's just not true. But there's some things that have to be met, some conditions that have to be met for that to happen. The first is the process of evaluation and legitimation, that the group of people evaluate this by saying it's either good or bad, right? And then more importantly, legitimation is, is it acceptable for people like us? 20 years ago, if someone was wearing you know, a sleeve of tattoos, we'll think that person is a degenerate, right? Like, oh my goodness, you must be a rock star or a gang or something. Now it's acceptable. Well, why is that? Because we have collectively decided that is acceptable. 20 years ago, if you were wearing sweatpants out in public, people said you've given up on life. Now you have an entire category called athleisure um, and multi-billion dollar uh, industry called athleisure that makes that kind of clothing because we have decided that it's acceptable. So the mechanisms that drive contagion cultural contagion in particular requires a the collective people saying yes this is acceptable or yes this is good and b this is acceptable even if they say yes it is bad but it's acceptable that's really what matters first that it's acceptable for people like us and then once we kind of go through this process of of, of recontextualizing its meaning reconciling it for ourselves and when we see other people like ourselves doing it we're more inclined to do it because nothing draws a crowd like a crowd. So we observe our people take on the behavior. It becomes a vote. It becomes a, a, you know, a, a thumbs up that this behavior is acceptable for people like us. And we, as Emil Durkheim puts it, we practice collective effervescence and adopt the behavior in an effort to promote social solidarity among people like ourselves. Yeah, it's a, a very helpful description. Thank you, Marcus. We have been here talking with Marcus Collins. The book is for the culture. You can learn more about it. Check out the book at marktothesea.com slash for the culture. Marcus, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And we will see you on better next week.